three winners, but one of the winners is here today. So, um, Senan, well done. Well done. Do you want to show everyone which one is yours? Do you know where it is? Jimmy Grodden built a hall in his father's field in Gowell in 1922. He built it so that people could dance and eat buns and watch plays and drink tea and talk. He built a hall for his neighbours in Efferna and Gowell even as far away as Bunsna, with no strings attached. Just wooden walls and a good foundation and a fine tin roof with labour supplied for free. People flocked to it and danced and danced till the small hours. They came on bicycles from Longford. All the best bands played, it was a great hall altogether. But Jimmy wouldn't give it to the priests. They wanted to own it. He didn't see why that should be. It was the people's hall. For this it was burned down on Christmas Eve in 1932. For this he was labelled an anti-Christ. For this he was tagged an undesirable alien, though he was Ephnina born. For this he was deported by De Valera in 1933 for no official reason ever given. But we all know why. Jimmy challenged power with a hall where people could dance without kowtowing to anyone. Just be free. How subversive can anyone be? Jimmy Grattan dances on in Leitrim. He dances on in Ireland. We will come from far and near, be part of his quick step revolution. Front foot and Dance. Yes. Well, man. I was talking to a man who was cycling to town and uh, <coughs> he said he was in the hall the first night it was opened and uh, what they were discussing was the messenger. It's a little red boot that uh, the church used to be always selling and that's, they were discussing that. The messenger would have had articles from the missions in Africa, South America, and still, as well. They still do, they still, yeah. the, still go on the messenger, still be at the churches. So that was the highly subversive uh, okay. activity okay. that was going on. They discussed all the local topics and rural topics, but yeah. it didn't have to be left or right, they discussed it. Well, we said Connie and Chris, which were sisters here, and we were born in the same house as Jimmy. Yeah. <laughs> it's never that galvanized is over, like, you know. When there was a deportation order against Jimmy, he, the, the guards came to, to capture him, and he said, uh, wait till I put on his suit, and escaped through, uh, when he went into the upstairs, he escaped through a hole in the, in the roof. <laughs> and was on the run for a good few months. Seven months. After, seven months after that. Sustained by the people of Leitrim. They found we've always been in contact with him. <laughs> he was a fine big man, he was about six foot two, and broad shoulders, no way from him. Yeah. And, uh, he went, well, I was telling the book for him, and they were there, and then they changed to the priest there. Yeah. But you want to hear that one? I think people would be interested. Can you all hear, yeah? Yeah, yeah? This is great stuff. But there was, uh, <coughs> in the Civil War, there was bands of fire aiming and free skates that were known in the stained houses. So there was five or six fire aiming in the grandfather's house, and they were there for up in two weeks, and there was no sign of them going. So we got to the middle of the time, he moved on and said, get the hell out of there, I have a family to rear. So the man in charge of these was called, uh, he got the man of Duff, Maura Farber was his name. And he went over to the other side, he got a good job. And he went to the other side and uh, my grandfather had, had a shop, he had to go into Carrick to get meal and flour. So he had to go in and get a doctor signed, and who was signing him with this Maura Farber? So he signed it and my grandfather went to the station and went to pick it up, he couldn't sign it. Instead of OK, he put KO on it. <laughs> so he had to go back and Moura Farrell wouldn't change it and he gave Moura Farrell a good date. And, <laughs> and I, think he, I think he had to go to jail for it, I don't know. He got jail for attacking Moura Farrell. I think he didn't get sent to jail. That's it. 
KO for knockout. <laughs> the spirit of Moral Farrell, I think, is what's uh, moved, what ruled Ireland for several decades afterwards. Uh, yeah, yeah. Change sides and then. He was even training Michael by our way of mini jail, but we got a good job. And had the inside information too to give him more power yeah, on yeah. the side that he turned. Well, on that note of realism, <laughs> <laughs> will we start to make our way towards uh, towards Ephraim, where we the shrine where it all happened. <laughs> this collection of uh, games, outdoor games for families to play with. So it's uh, all from recycled and natural materials. Um, and as you can see with the child here, they, the kids play with these games as they like and as they see fit, really. Picks <laughs> and ladders. So you, you spin your dice and then you, you, you move your counter up or down or across and down the snakes. and. Do you make all these yourself? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's, the, the, most of the boards are elm and the uh, native materials like honeysuckle and birch and. and I, so, <laughs> so very, very handy then to be able to stand up. To, you don't have to stoop down to pick up your um, your skittles. It's um, ship skittles. It's called from ships skittles. Oh, is it? So yeah. the sailors would use it at, um, at sea so the skittles wouldn't fall overboard, basically. <laughs> and your ball as well wouldn't fall overboard, you know. Yeah. And you know the funniest thing is that any show, the kids will not be on the phones, they'll play away. The parents will be on the phones oh, videoing the kids playing on the games. Yeah, exactly. So it's learned behaviour. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is uh, Paul Gualton and uh, my grandparents were both first cousins of Jimmy Gualton. Uh, my father, Jim James, was born in the farm over there, as was Jimmy, and we still keep the farm to this day. Um, Jimmy was a very special person. He stood up for the rights of ordinary people and we've commemorated him here with the monument in Ephena, his home place. Today is all about us coming together to remember Jimmy and to think about what he did and his legacy and what we'd like to do now. We're having a kind of con community consultation here today to see what we do with the land um, and what we could do with this space and maybe recreate something in Jimmy's memory and Jimmy's honour, but also for us as a people today to kind of give us something, a focus for our aspirations and uh, maybe be a focus for thinking and maybe a bit of challenge to things that are wrong in our society. The Occupied Territories Bill is a piece of legislation that wants to ban goods that come from these illegal settlements. The settlements, I went, I drove through them. They're, sure. they're like, it's like driving through Florida. Palm trees, wall, uh, big, big waterfalls, beautiful shopping centers. These are settlements that are built on land that doesn't belong to the people. They belong to the Palestinian people. It doesn't belong to the Israel government. It belongs to the Palestinian people. And you drive two minutes down the road and the Palestinian are the people are living in horrendous poverty with no, with their water is polluted, their electricity gets cut off, they're not allowed to build homes for themselves, they're pushed off their own land constantly and constantly living in fear. Children are being arrested, their parents are not allowed to go to the courts, they're kept in cages. I mean, it's like the most inhumane scenario I've ever seen in my life. 
And that's why this legislation is so important to the Palestinian people. We have to get it passed. Thankfully, we were able to bring all of the opposition parties on board. The only one that's not supporting is the government parties. And our job now is to continue. We've only, we've only to get this bill now through committee stage. There will be a report that comes out. And if there's no money message, which there's always a threat of a money message uh, in Leinster House for opposition bills. Every single party has had opposition, has had their bills stopped because of this money message. So we hope to fight it and we hoped to get this legislation passed by the end of this year. But at some point I might be coming back up to you all and asking you for your support. I will be asking you for support. I will be asking for you to lobby local TDs, local government TDs, to make sure that this legislation gets passed. It gives the, the Palestinian people so much hope. So what we're trying to do is ban goods that come from the illegal settlements. We have to do it. I'm going to just take a couple of quotes from Declan, because Declan, I know Declan, I, I feel I have to repeat a little bit what you said, because I read your, your website today and I thought it was so powerful. In an arbitrary of the Irish advocate, Charlie Bourne concluded, this is about J Jimmy Gralton. One might disagree with Gralton, but nobody could doubt his sincerity. Let all of us who believe in the principles for which Gralton stood, pledge ourselves anew to the continuation of the fight for complete political, cultural and economical rights of the working classes in all lands. So long live the spirit of Jimmy Gralton. I'm going to sing a song for you now that I think he would like. Um, I will try and sing it quickly because I see you're all getting drowned. Um, it's a wonderful song that was written by Oon McCall and I do believe that if Jimmy Gralton was here today, and maybe he's looking down on us, I think he'd appreciate it. This is a song called Legal Illegal. Every time you pick up a newspaper, every time you switch on the TV, you can bet your old boots that at some point you'll see a high-ranking banker or else a TD calling on all who are meant to be free to stand up and defend law and order. It's illegal to rip off a payroll. It's illegal to hold up a tray. But it's illegal to rip off a million or two that comes from the labors that other folk do to plunder the men on behalf of a few. It's a thing that is perfectly legal. It's illegal to kill off your landlord or to trespass upon his estate. But to charge a high rent for a slum is okay. To condemn two adults and three children to stay in a hovel that's rotten with damp and decay. It's a thing that is perfectly legal. If your job turns you into a zombie, then it's legal to feel some despair. But don't get too aggressive and don't get too smart. For Christ's sake, don't upset the old apple cart. Remember your boss has your interests at heart and it grieves him to see you unhappy. If you fashion a bomb in your kitchen, then you're guilty of breaking the law. But a bloody great nuclear plant is okay. And plutonium processing hastens the day when this small little isle will be blasted away. Nonetheless, it is perfectly legal. It's illegal if you are a traveler to camp by the side of the road. But it's proper and right for the rich and the great to live in a mansion and own an estate that was got from the people by pillage and rape. Well, that's what they call a tradition. It's illegal to kill off your missus 
or put poison in your romance tea. But poison the rivers, the seas and the skies, and poison the minds of a nation with lies. It's all in the interest of free enterprise. Nonetheless, it is perfectly legal. Well, it's legal to sing on the telly. But make bloody sure that you don't to say about racists or fascists or creeps or those in high places who live off the weak and those who are selling us right up the creek. The twisters, the takers, the con men, the fakers, the whole bloody gang of exploiters. <laughs>There was a lament played afterwards on, on flute called e Seamus Ennis's Easter Snow. And the wonderful artist, uh, musician and performer who played that is here with us today to play it for you. Catherine Bell, put your hands together please. Thank you. Be not, don't need to say a whole lot about it, doesn't need to be eloquent, not an eloquent person, and um, doesn't need to be happening. Um, so I have to say that. Cheers, don't have a problem. Cheers, don't have a problem. Cheers, don't have a we, we had a play up in um, North Leitrim called Jimmy Grattan's Dance Hall in 2012, and then there was, of course, the film you all know about, and then there was the Abbey production. But um, there's somebody here who was involved in both directed the uh, Jimmy's uh, Jimmy Grattan's dance hall, and was, played one of the leading roles in the the film Jimmy's Hall, and that's um, Sorica Fox. And and if you put your hands together, we'll have a, a few words. Um, a couple of poems, I believe, from Sirica Fox. Thanks very much. Thanks a million. Oh, hello. Thanks a million, Donald. And um, it's a great privilege to be um, involved in anything to do with Jimmy Grant and his hall and the whole spirit of community 
activism, challenge, resistance, celebration that Jimmy Grodden represents. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, I, I'm just going to do two short pieces. Um, and the first is really, uh, I saw on the back of the banner there, that's a banner that's been many times used. It says, Jimmy Grodden's dance hall. It says, welcome to Manor Hamilton, children of Gaza. And it says, ban fracking on the back of it. Uh, I think it's a, it's a good Grafton type banner um, and, and the fracking ban was really uh, really resisted by the people of Leitrim North and South successfully um, and again with the Save Leitrim movement to um, uh, Quinta and the plantations again hugely strong in South Leitrim so I wanted to do this poem um, which speaks of an other uh, resistors on behalf of the environment of the people and the place which is the only reason that, that people uh, create this kind of resistance um, and I'm, I wrote it after meeting uh, Willie and Mary Cordoff in Rasport in Mayo um, and Willie had just been beaten by Shell private security and he was still in the bed and uh, I, I, he didn't talk about Shell at all um, or the pipeline he talked about himself and his father and I wrote this after meeting them. So I'll read this now uh, in solidarity with the people of Rasport, but also in support of the people of Leitrim and their opposition to fracking and uh, to the Save Leitrim movement. Cordove. Myself and my father made the fields green. Bucket by lonely bucket, small hands frozen to stone, hauled up from the blasted shoreline, and spread on the land's old bones. Seaweed picked from the cold, dark shore, bucket by freezing bucket. My bent head watching my father's feet and salt in the cracks of my knuckles. My father, his back the shape of a scythe, his gansey a wind-filled balloon, took my hopeless handfuls and made the black fields bloom. When I straighten my back now and stop, to see what my father made. With my gansey full sail behind me and my hands now the span of my spade and my children walking beyond toward the path at the edge of the sea, the old bones know that I am these fields and that these green fields are me. They beat me till my hands went limp, till the six of them were tired. I played dead as you would for an animal, gone sick in the head and wild. They tell me I must stop fighting. I must lie down and let them pass. They say money is God here, Willie, and protest the roar of an ass. But I hear my father's whisper in every blade of grass. And deep as though in Ogoni land, I can feel my father's pulse when bruises bloom on Ogoni throats. Blather rack yellow, the purple of dulse. Foot by aching foot, we nourish this starving land. Heart by broken heart, and hand by tiny hand. Thank you. And in light of what everybody else was saying, um, thinking about the theme of home, um, and the home is where the heart is and thinking of where people have travelled from today to be here uh, as far away as uh, Drumsna and Manor and, and some people um, like this woman in Carrick has had a longer journey and I had the privilege to meet her and um, we had a beautiful day in Drumshambo and the industrial kitchens there uh, with Jackie McKenna uh, and Mary Byrne um, making bread from Syria and Kurdish bread and uh, Nigerian bread and it was such a joyous day and later I found out that this was the story of how she came to be here. This is Suad's story. It's called Hi Friend. Our little daughter grew to the age of five years living in constant fear and horror because of the war in our country Syria. She witnessed so many terrible and evil things and was completely traumatized by them. We were already severely traumatized, but at least we were adults. Our daughter was small, innocent, helpless, relying on us to help her live a normal life.
But in the situation of war, of so much violence and brutality, we were helpless too, to protect her. Watching her suffer caused us so much pain. Eventually, we made the decision to flee our country, to leave our home, everyone we knew and loved. We wanted to escape so that we could give our little one a chance at a normal life, a life that was peaceful, safe and tranquil. So we did what desperate people do when faced with the terribleness of war wrecking their lives. We tried to escape. We set out to flee to sea in an inflatable dinghy which was meant to hold a maximum of 34 people. Instead, it held 65 human beings, including a 70-year-old woman, all crammed in together, each person as desperate as we were to save our lives and the lives of our children to find our way safely out of the nightmare we'd been living in for six years. The boat was to bring us from Turkey to Greece. The sea was rough, with heavy swells. The winds fierce, buffeting our fragile and overloaded dinghy. Five kilometers out from the Turkish coast, we got into great difficulty. One of my daughters used her mobile phone to call the Coast Guard for help, but our boat sank and we all ended up in the sea. It was terrifying. I clung onto a rope threaded through a loop on one of the sides of the waterlogged dinghy. My daughter hung on my back, with her arms around my neck. The sea was freezing, and I became exhausted with the effort to keep gripping the rope. What kept me going, kept me from letting go, was my daughter's voice at my ear among all those waves tearing at her bodies. Please hold on. Please don't drown. I need you. We all need you, she kept saying. On and on, she kept saying it, kept begging me. On and on. And somehow, in the face of such mountainous odds, I held on. A lighthouse keeper on the Turkish coast spotted us and sent out a Turkish fishing vessel to rescue us. That 70-year-old woman drowned. I often think of her and of three other men who drowned as well. How heartbreaking, how terrible it was for them and their families. To this day, the terror of war and of the sea still prevails in us. My daughter is 11 years old now, and we are finally living in a safe place, Carrick and Shannon. She is trying hard to forget the past and prays for peace and survival for the rest of the people in her country. Thank you. Sue story. I just want to, at this moment, we were supposed to have um, a, a few words from a woman called Donna Sabanda Vuma, who's a spokes, she's a leading light of the of Massey, the movement of asylum seekers in Ireland. She's from uh, Zimbabwe, but she couldn't be here because her grandmother sadly passed away, uh, but uh, just the other day. But uh, if. A couple of months ago, uh, with, in Donna's company, I met um, a woman called Fati Mohammed from Somalia. And she's in the uh, Drek Provision Centre in Ballyhonis in County Mayo. And she has set up, believe it or not, in the spirit of Jimmy Galton's Hall, a Foroiga Club in Ballyhonis for the teenagers of the town for the teenagers who are in the direct provision centre and the teenagers in the travellers site. That's been done by Fati Mohammed from Somalia. So I'd just like her to say a few words. Would you put your hands together, please, for somebody who holds the light of the Grazen image alive. Hi, everybody. As Donald knows, he always puts me on the spotlight. I'm so sorry, I was not prepared at all. Um, but I just want to say thank you everyone for coming. I know the weather is awful, but what can we do? Typical Irish weather. Um, yeah, I came to Ireland two years ago. Uh, when I came to Ireland, I went to the direct provision based in Ballyhornis. Um, where, when I came there, the community would refer us as the up the hill and the people in the direct provision will refer the community as down the hill. 
we had that barrier and isolation. That's when I decided, you know what, this has to end. Um, I came with a woman, I collaborated with a woman called Laura, and that's when I had to decide something for the teenagers and a youth service like me. Uh, when I open and when we talk about it, like what activities will we need for the teenagers and what do we want to see in the community in Balihones, that's when we decided a Farovica Youth Service. And I'm very delighted and been happy today that our Farovica has been growing well and we have a lot of activities for the youth services and we are hoping now the barriers and the bridges will be breaking soon. Um, and thank you so much, that's all I can say. Thank you. The spirit of Carlton lives on. Talking about Leitrim, look, it's about time we have one of the heroes of Leitrim music. Charlie McGettigan is a legend. Charlie McGettigan is a Eurovision winner. And he's here today in Effermat to commemorate Jimmy Grant's homecoming. I'm living in Drumshambo uh, for the last 47 years, and believe it or not, it's the first time I've ever stood in Ephraim. It's only 10 minutes down the road, but uh, it's lovely to be here on such an, an auspicious occasion. Um, Vincent Woods is a good friend of mine, uh, a writer, a playwright, and a broadcaster. And uh, a couple of years ago, we put this song together. Um, I've, ne I've never actually sung it before, but I'm going to have a go at it now. Son of the loy and the soil, child of oppression and poverty, you fought freedom's hard war, a believer in liberty. Jim Gralton, you never came home, driven out of this priest-ridden island, denounced, burnt out, hunted down. Transported away to America, undesirable alien, De Valera's decree, undesirable alien, driven out of his country, rebel heart beaten low, an undeclared prisoner of war, the new political masters don't want thinking poor at their door, farewell to the sky over Ephrona. To Gowell, Drum Shambo, she Bjogan, she more. The bishops and the greasy shopkeepers want only unquestioning poor. Undesirable alien, Devil Era's decree. Undesirable alien, driven out of his country. Place a rose on his grave in the shade of the Statue of Liberty. Let honor erase. This stain on his memory, undesirable alien, Devil Era's decree, undesirable alien, driven out of his country. Thank you. Well, another uh, great hero of this part of the world was a man uh, called Packy Dagnan. And uh, Packy sadly is no longer with us. He came from the Arigna Mountain, a place called Gubberother. But uh, he was always the first professional musician that I ever met, and uh, in that he was a total professional. He made his entire drinking money, his food money, and everything from playing his food. But there was a guy uh, opened a pub in Drumshambo way back in the 1950s. He was what we used to call a returned yank, and he was known as the jerk, uh, mainly because he called everybody else a jerk. Uh, and, but uh, he, Dagnan was a, ve a regular visitor to the pub, and uh, of course he'd get out with what he called, he'd get out and play his music and, and uh, get his pints for free for the night. But one day the jerk said to him, hey Dagnan, you goddamn jerk, he said, get out of here with that three-piece wallet of yours and don't come back. So I thought it was a great idea for a song, the fact that the three-piece wallet was the flute that he kept in his inside pocket. And it goes like this. Play for you, why wouldn't I? Sure I'd play all night and day. And tomorrow do the same again, it would cause me no great pain. And me down me three-piece wallet, pay to your drum a long in time. Play for you, why wouldn't I give me what the reason why? I 
I've played for them in Dublin town, in old Baggett Street, so gay. They could fill a pint of porter there, they did drive your mind in the straight. Sure, I play the mouse in that public house and the books of board and more. And women in Medsity hear it again, they would stand to their knees in the snow. Play for you, why wouldn't I? Sure, I'd play all night and day. And tomorrow do the same again, it would cause me no great pain. And me down me three-piece wallet, bait at your drum a locking in time. Play for you, why wouldn't I? Give me what good reason why. The other day I played for them in the county of Westmeath. I landed, didn't kill back in town, or my friends invited me. In Edgeward Stoughton and Mullingar, I stopped to take a mees. I landed, didn't a blaze of green and met good company. Played for you, why wouldn't I? Sure, I'd play all night and day. And tomorrow do the same again, it would cause me no great pain. And me down, me three piece wallet, baited your drum a lot in time. Play for you, why wouldn't I give me what good reason why? Well, Packy Dignan was possibly the best dressed flute player in the world. He was always immaculately dressed, a clean white shirt and a lovely suit. And in the winter time, he'd wear a fair isle sweater under it to keep himself warm. But he always wore a gold goldless medal in his left hand lapel. I don't know what it was for, I don't think he knew what it was for, somebody just gave it to him one time. But another flute player from Drum Sna, and I won't mention his name, I met him one day and he had a medal just very similar to Packy's, and I thought that's unusual, he wasn't that good a flute player. And I met Packy in the high street one of the days, and I said, I see a man in Drum Sna, I won't mention his name in case I get sued. He said, I see a man in Drumsna has a medal just like yours, Packy. You know, and Packy just turned to me and said, ah, he says he bought it. <laughs> There's famous men of music who have come to visit me. They're recording me for posterity. At least that's what they tell me. It seems I'm part of the dying art, taking history. But your art apart, I haven't the heart to play for the likes of ye. Sing if you want. Play for you, why wouldn't I? Sure, I'd play all night. Day. And tomorrow do the same again, it would cost me no great pain. And me down me three piece wallet, made it your drum a lock in time. Play for you, why wouldn't I give me what good reason why? Thank you very much, enjoy the rest of the day. And now we have another legendary Leitrim musician to take the stage now. Mick Blake has made such an amazing impact in the last few years, been recorded by Christy Moore, among others. Will you put your hands together, please, for the great Mick Blake? So I think I'm the, the second in the, the string of bearded singer-songwriters this evening, so... Uh, hard to follow Charlie, though. Okay, um, I'm going to start with this one, and um, I suppose the only way I could describe it, it's about Potatoes, Lord Leitrim, and the self-proclaimed socialist, Bertie Ahern. It's called Leitrim, A Brief History. Carrick on Shannon, 1845. The dreams of their living don't arrive. Start this again. At Carrick on Shannon, 1845. The landlords in Leitrim in droves did arrive. Help me out here. They all to a man were invited to go to the Cora Drum Rooster Cultural Show. The streets were bedecked with farm produce galore, and fashions the likes of which weren't seen before. There were traders from Sligo displaying their wares. A band from Drum Snap played enlivening air. Yeah. 
when the show it had ended. The gentry repaired to church's hotel where a menu was served. A pedigree beef, fine lamb and fish. They feasted on every conceivable dish. The head of the table, Lord Leitrim, stood up and said, Gentlemen, let us now drain a cup to our Lord Lieutenant. Victoria, our Queen, the finest monarch that Ireland has seen. A farmer from Mobile rose from his chair and begged the indulgence of everyone there. It falls upon me, sir, I regret to say to temper with caution this glorious day. There's news of a curse that is born on the breeze. A newly discovered potato disease. There are chewers in Flanders, black in the ground. But there are other sources of food can be found. I fear that this blackness is coming our way. Alternative sustenance without delay must be found if our tenants are going to survive. For it's on the potato alone that they thrive. Lord Leitrim laughed, put down his beer, regarded the poor farmer Smith with a sneer. This talk of blight and of shortage of food doesn't do my appetite any good. So Farmer Smith, we beseech you and pray, do not sully and darken this glorious day with your pessimist mind, your pessimist frown. We demand, sir, at once you desist and sit down. For potatoes are plentiful and disease-free, and potatoes are perfect nutritionally to feed all our peasants and keep them content to pay us our summer's exorbitant rent. Carrigon Shannon, 2005. The town had expanded and business was thriving. We were the landlords, a new king was crowned. A tiger whose unrestrained grief in your bounds. A few brave dissenters said, People take care, there's a blight on our finances. Please be aware that it's all built on nothing. Why such demand for houses of clay on foundations of sand? Our valiant leader rose up and said, The grudgers like you would be better off dead. We'll be the first food to never go bust. No need to change, there's no need to adjust. For Captain Fitzpatrick and Corporal Drum will march all our destinies into the sun. And loose regulation will set our boys free to do what they like to our economy. Languishing here in my ghostly estate The tiger is gone, now the wolf's in the gate A ghost of that farmer from Black 45 Still haunts the highways with told you so cries Still they don't listen, they don't want to hear That the good times will end, that the swill disappears And all the pig trappings, no more in the offing Till it's too late Now Lord Lee is gone and his tenants are free. There's a Nama hotel where his home used to be. And a new type of landlord lays claim to our land. Speaking a language I don't understand. I don't understand. Don't understand. I don't understand. Thank you. Thanks for the prompt there. One of the four knows, Grant. Funny for this one. 
Um, the population of Leitrim in 1841 was 156,000, and today it's less than a quarter of that. So uh, I think we can fit in a few more people. Um, this next one is uh, again based on the famine, which of course wasn't really a famine at all. And the original work and title of this was the um, catastrophic failure of laissez-faire neoliberal policy in Ireland, 1845 to the present day. But I couldn't fit in the album cover, so um, I changed it to the rich man's feast. Said that Queen Victoria was as grand as she was tall. And when it came to banqueting, she could out eat them all. She trawled through seven courses in 30 minutes straight. And asked about the Irish once she'd licked the seventh plate. She told the royal treasury to send 2,000 pounds. Show their starving subjects that their queen's love knew no bounds. A few crumbs from her table, and her conscience was at peace. When the poor man's famine was the rich man's feast. A sultan lord of Turkey. Heard of Ireland's plight, took pity on the Irish, and to the Queen did write, Your Majesty, I'd like to send ten thousand pounds to feed your subjects in Hibernia in their time of need. But the Christian Queen could not be bettered by a Muslim war, so she told him that he could not send a green some than her to save the royal blushes his charity decreased when the poor man's famine was the rich man's feet. across the wide Atlantic the noble people dwell and in the name of progress, suffer their own hell. Driven from their homeland by ruthless profiteers, the Choctaw died in thousands all along the trail of tears. On hearing of the starving isle across the ocean wide, they gathered every cent they had and sent it on the tide. Oh, they had known a hunger like their brothers to the east When the poor man's famine was the rich man's feast Now blight is often quoted as the root of Ireland's woes but enough to feed this country two times over left these shores. The army guarded ports from Donegal to Bantry Bay. So British ships could safely carry Irish food away. And the good Queen's chief economist, Lord Nassau, couldn't hide his bitter disappointment when just one million died. The blood of the Irish kept the wheels of commerce greased. When the poor man's famine was the rich man's feast. A century has come and gone, still we never learn. 
the decency is cast aside where profits are concerned. It's not with food but water that they try to beat us down. Donna's Queen Victoria, King Dennis wears the crown. And under some delusion that the markets just might care, our government play middleman to the gambling billionaire. All the rich avoid their taxes, and the working man is fleeced. And the poor man's famine still the rich man's fleece. And what we allow continues as history repeats and the poor man's famine is the rich man's need. Thank you very much. Now we have two of them. Well, I don't think uh, they're they may not actually be Leitrim itself, but in the Leitrim environs. Um, Shamey O'Dowd and Rick Epping are two of the most uh, highly rated musicians in Ireland. And they're here today to play in Everniff for Jimmy Grattan's homecoming. They're two, they also happen to be two parts of the three piece, The Unwanted. And the songs that The Unwanted sing are very much the kind of songs that Jimmy Gralton may have heard when he was living in America, both before he came back and afterwards. Dust Bowl. You're well, it's not nice to think of um, Dust Bowl weather today in Ephraim. So, uh, I'll leave you in the capable hands of Shamey and Rick. I mean, it's, uh, we really, I think we really all, all appreciate you standing out. It's not the greatest of weather, but. Fair play to you for a second. Give yourselves a round of applause for sticking it out there. Fair play to you. Oh. I really appreciate it. Um, a song written by a, a, man called, a man called Tommy Sands. Uh, that sing, I think it's suitable for the occasion. Well, I wouldn't hear your music and the phone your pendants down. And I wouldn't read your writing and the band you're from the town But I couldn't stop you dreaming and the victory that you'd won For you sown the seeds of freedom in your daughters and your sons In your daughters and your sons In your daughters and your sons You sown the seeds of freedom in your daughters and your sons When your weary smile proudly hides the chin marks in your hands As you bravely strive to realize the rights of every man and though you never got your share of the fruits that you had won, you sowed the seeds of justice in your daughters and your sons, in your daughters and your sons, in your daughters and your sons. You sowed the seeds of justice in your daughters and your sons. Well, no one knew your religion, but one day they heard you pray for a word where everyone could work and children they could play. Though you never got your share of the victory that you won You sowed the seeds of equality in your daughters and your sons In your daughters and your sons In your daughters and your sons You sowed the seeds of equality in your daughters and your sons Sown the seeds of freedom in your daughters and your sons, in your daughters and your sons, in your daughters and your sons. You sown the seeds of freedom in your daughters and your sons, in your daughters and your sons, in your daughters and your sons. You sown the seeds of freedom in your daughters and your sons. Tommy Sands song there.
We'll give, we'll, give, we'll, give, we'll give it one more and uh, I'm going to let uh, Rick tell you all about it. Um, Rick, Rick is actually from that part of Leitrim known as California. Well, this is just an old song. I'm from, I'm from the Sligo part of it. This is an old song from the 1930s called Down in the Old Hometown, an old string band song from the American South. And uh, it's kind of built around the old square dance tune of the Arkansas Traveler. Once again, thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you. I got a gal and her name is Sue Down in the old hometown Her hair is black and her eyes are blue Down in the old hometown Oh, she smoked tobacco and she did stuff too And there ain't nothing that she won't do Oh, we get drunk on old home brew Oh, down in the old hometown Ah, down in the old hometown In the old hometown In the old hometown And the sweetest girl in the world I asked that girl to marry me down in the old hometown. She said, You got to ask my old daddy down in the old hometown. I told the old fella that I loved her well. We just waiting for the wedding bell. But the old man told me to go to Oh down in the old hometown. Oh down in the old hometown, in the old hometown, in the old hometown. And the sweetest girl in the world. She lives in the old hometown. I got a job on a country farm down in the old hometown. The work was easy, but the weather was warm down in the old hometown. They sent me out to milk a cow. I never had milk, I didn't know how. I tried to milk that daddy cow. Oh, down in the old hometown. Ah, oh, down in the old hometown. Down in the old hometown. The sweetest girl in the world. I believe Vincent McGrath is among the gathering. Um, can Vincent? Oh, there he is over here. Uh, Vincent, do you want to come up now? And we'll have um, a, a couple of tunes from Vincent. But also, most importantly, uh, 
Vincent was one of the, the Rossport Five, and the last time he spoke here was in 2006, after he spent three months in prison uh, for, uh, <clears throat> oh, he, he can tell you himself, to do with a court order imposed by Shell Carlip. But uh, it's fantastic to have Vincent here, because not only that, he also used to play in London in a pub called The Rising Sun that was run by Margaret Mortison, Mary Mortison, <coughs> who is a second cousin of uh, the Graltons. So uh, Vincent knew the whole story backwards, and not only that, but Vin is it, I won't blow your thunder. Vincent would also tell you an amazing... Um, uh, historical some historical links between his own uncle and Jimmy Carlton in New York. So, do you want to give us that, Vincent? Thank you very much. Thank you, Donald. I think you might be a bit sensationalist because you might be disappointed with that. But here goes down um, uh, 2006. I remember I was asked up here where after being. Uh, released from jail, or should I rephrase that to say that we, because of public opinion and people like yourselves, they were forced to let us out. But um, Declan Bree, I was trying to think who invited me up, it was Declan Bree, and uh, he asked me to say a few words about Jim Ralston. And I was talking to my sister over in London about it. I said, I'm asked to go up to Leitrim, I have to go up next week and talk about Jim Ralston, and I know nothing about him echoing what several speakers said here already, and it's to an eternal shame that we don't, didn't know enough about him. But it's also, I think, a um, reflection of the, the system and how they kept people like Ralston, how they kept them well hidden from the, the rest of us. But anyways, uh, my sister said, uh, do you not know, that's, that's uh, Mary Morrison, yeah. and uh, Mary Morrison and the Rising Sun. She said, that's Jimmy Ralston's cousin. And she said, she has a little booklet, my cousin Jimmy. <laughs> I said, and I said, will you send it to me? Because I might go up and maybe sound a little learned when I go up there. By the book. But um, so it brought, and I was talking to my, my uh, brother-in-law, I uh, used to serve in that pub as well. It's where we used to, when I used to walk there for the summers, we had a little cottage there beside the Rising Sun, there in Winston. We used to call it the cottage. And uh, we, this was our local pub. And, and Steve, uh, Mary, Mary Groulton's husband, Steve uh, Morrison, I think they came back to the <coughs> Valley Farm after that. And uh, that was our local. And uh, I used to play there, the accordion. And Steve used to come down out on the bar and sing a few songs. His favorite one, be the court man. He used to sing cock songs, but he used to sing Tipperary Town. That was his favorite one. But anyways, um, that was the Groucho. Now, my brother-in-law, Johnny Kennedy, from Sligo Town, by the way, Dexter, I don't you know, from Martin Savage Terrace, he used to work there on the bar as well. But there was another connection. I, when I was doing research on my uncle, he was a great musician in America, and I was doing some research on him, and I was reading the Irish uh, Advocate, and I was coming across a lot of material there, and I was also, at this time, aware of Jimmy Ralston, so I was picking up some information as I went along. Now, my father and my two uncles, they had a band in New York in 1928. That was the time of the Prohibition, and there was no pubs, it was just the ballrooms of the dance halls. So from 1928 until 1934, when the dance halls more or less ended with the repeal of Prohibition, uh, they had a hall there in Third Avenue. And I was looking at some of the material from the Irish Echo, and there's one here, and it's... Uh, I see that. Yeah. It's actually the, yeah. it's the fourth annual ball under the auspices of the Leitrim Republican Association at Duffy's Hall. This was the hall they used to play in, and it was um, opened by Pad Pad Paddy Duffy. I better get used to my too far back. Yeah, now, Paddy Duffy was from Charlestown, and he opened this hall in Third Avenue in 1928. And that's where my uncles and they used to play there. And there were also another player there, Jimmy Cunningham from Roscommon, from Balmain. And there was um, a fellow from Newtown Falls. 
Nike bought Nike Day. So that was the time the Emerald Dialogue. But anyways, the Leitrim uh, Republican Association at Duffy's Hall, 3rd Avenue, they were having their fourth annual ball there. And um, there's, and they would have danced to my father's music and to my uncle's music there in 1929. And uh, I see some of the names down here at the Arrangements Committee, and Jim Groucho is in here uh, in the Arrangements Committee. And you see that, that's very interesting, isn't it? So not alone that, they would have met him and he would have danced to the music. So that's a lovely connection. Now, I said, uh, I was saying, Doug, Declan, not Declan, but Donald asked me to say a few words here. And I said, um, what can I say that people don't know already? So if you could bear with me, I, I looked back at what I had written and what I said in 2006. And with a few amendments, I think I should tell you to say that again. Now, this is the abridged version of what I said. It's like this abridged version that you see on the BBC Radio 4, you know, the book for bedtime. Don't happen as well. But um, if you bear with me, and it's very relevant, and I make sure I know what some speakers said already. Yeah. Okay, then. Um, now, we come back now to 2006. And if there's any inaccuracies in what I said then, I'd ask Donald, you should let Donald know, and Donald will come and correct us, because that's important as well. Now, I, I want to say, the more things change, the more they remain the same, isn't it? Now, the, the fact that I, as one of the Rosberg Five, have been invited to speak here today, at the Grantham Commemorative Weekend, suggests that people see parallels between our situation and that which prevailed in County Leitrim in the early decades of the 20th century. The obvious similarity is that a small group of people paid a heavy price for daring to challenge very powerful interests. Those who believe that our land and our labor and our natural resources exist for their benefit alone. The Rosberg Five spent 94 days in jail for daring to stand up to powerful oil company, endangering the lives of their families and their community. Jim Gladson was in conflict with the clergy, the most powerful group in Ireland at the time, and with the politicians whom the clergy controlled. Gladson and the Rosberg Five were in a minority, but were convinced of the righteousness of their position. Being on your own or in a minority position can be a very cold place. But if you have a social conscience and if you're born with a deep sense of injustice, you are not afraid. Jim Gladson wasn't afraid. To quote from Margaret Bradson's book, My Cousin Jimmy. She says, those in power did not intimidate him easily. Knowledge and information is power, and keeping people ignorant is a means of maintaining control over their lives. Bradson was a progressive man, and saw that education was the key to the liberation of the poor and the downtrodden, to improving the lot of the small farmers and the laborers for whom he campaigned so tirelessly. He was following the advice of the patriot Thomas Davis, who wrote in 1846, said, educate that you may be free. Gralson built the Pierce County Hall here in Neffernan with his own money and with the voluntary labor of the local community. And it was a great example of community efforts and cooperation. Post-primary classes were arranged, and uh, as well as lessons in music and dancing. Now, this did not go down well with the clergy, who always had control of education and who apparently believed that the imparting of knowledge was the, in their gift alone. In our case, in Mayo, knowledge and information has been a major weapon in our campaign. The planners and our parties tried to overwhelm us. I think the word is overload. They gave us um, stacks of thick folders containing EISs and QRAs, this will be relevant now to the frackers who were opposing fracking up in uh, Fermanagh. Uh, in Gurchin, by the way, uh, people of Gurchin were down in Rossport uh, and we met them there over a year ago, so we would be given the, the benefit of our, of our knowledge. But, um, but um, our people, they went through the material and exposed the inaccuracies and inconsistencies and the contradictions and indeed the reckless nature of the Colour Gas Project. The politicians and the clergy, they had no arguments to counter Jim Gralton, so they resorted to name-calling and spears and threats. He was a communist, financed from Russia. His hall was a din of iniquity, 
and put at the cost there were occasions of sin as well. They tried to turn the community against him, and eventually the hall was set on fire. In Rossport, the vested interests tried to isolate and marginalize us. The methods employed in Grant's time would obviously wouldn't work, but instead we were portrayed, portrayed as blue guides who were coming in the way of progress. Now, the position of the clergy in our case is very interesting because when the Carl of Gas was first promoted in 2000, the Bishop of Kilala and the parish priest, they were whisked away in a helicopter 83,000 or 83 kilometers offshore to bless the oil rig. And they probably thought that with the imprimatur of the bishops that the flock would follow. Uh, it should be said, by the way, for the record, that during the summer, I'm talking about 2006, bear in mind, during the summer, um, the two, the parish priests and the two local curists, they refused to, allow, to meet with Shell while lost for five were in jail. And it has to be said that they would remain very supportive of their community. I'm sure that Jimmy Valter would be very pleased with this positive development. Now, although Gladson was a soldier and in the British Army, and he was given the task of training volunteers in the Republican movement, I think he would, he would have been very supportive of our peaceful campaign. Again, to quote from his cousin's book, he said he always hated violence and stressed the importance of social thinking and acting rather than resorting to force. In Gladson's day, people all over all Ireland, especially in rural areas, had a strong sense of being part of the community. Money was very scarce and the people, they bartered and they shared with one another. At busy times of the year, when cussing and gathering the turf and the hay, patching, when planting and digging the potatoes, neighbours would get together and pool their resources and their labour. This was called the metal. It's a, dip, a word we still use today. With a strong community, the weak are not pushed aside and ignored. All people are not discarded because they're no longer considered to be productive in the economic sense. It's not a case of everybody for himself or herself. People care what happens to their neighbours. Gladstone would not approve of the individualism that seems to prevail in many parts of Ireland today. I think he would be appalled at the number of homeless people sleeping on our, on our streets in the midst of plenty. He would have a lot to say about the old and the weak laying on trolleys in the corridors of our hospitals at a time when we boast that the country is awash with money. How would he feel about the exploitation of foreign workers? I think we know the answer. I have no doubt that he would stand shoulder to shoulder with the people of Mayo in defending their homes and in highlighting the scandalous giveaway of our natural resources. Now, finally, uh, I'd like to comment on the sense of betrayal that we felt in North New York and that Ralston must have felt in his day as well. In Rashford, we felt down and let, let down and betrayed by the authorities, the planners in New York County Council and in the Department of the Communications, Marine and Natural Resources. And uh, especially, we felt let down by the cowardly politicians from the main political parties. These are the people we elect and pay to safeguard our interests. And it begs the question, what is the point in having a TD who will remain silent and will not support you on the most fundamental and important matter of all, your personal safety? As a result of our experiences, we'd be very slow to accept any assurances given by the authorities in the future. We trust in ourselves and in our ability. James Granson had campaigned and raised money for the Republican cause, and he must have felt betrayed by the lack of support from his former colleagues when his deportation order was issued against him in 1933. Banishing him from his homeland without a trial as an undesirable alien. As Granson himself said, my treatment comes ill at the hands of representatives of people who have been crying against persecution for centuries. This sent sentiment is echoed in the letter I received from my American cousin. He said, I cannot understand how an Irish government, whose existence emerged following a glorious struggle against British rule, is now using the same tyrannical tactics 
against its own people. In conclusion, let me say that where there is injustice in the world, there will be people like Jim Ralston who will rise up and rail against it. There will always be people like Ralston who will make great sacrifices in the cause of justice and who will subordinate their own interests to the common good, to the well-being of the community. Men like Ralston have been inspired by like men and women who went before them. And men like Ralston will be an inspiration and future to all those who oppose injustice in whatever form it may manifest itself. While the clergy were preaching the Christian message, it was Jim Ralston who was talking about Christ. Thank you. So listen, I've just called now on um, some of the musicians from uh, Jimmy Granton's dance hall that we did in 2012. It's just a little quick uh, three, four minutes, um, the finale of um, Jimmy Granton's dance hall. Um, we have Shami O'Dowd and Dee uh, Armstrong and, uh, and Kira Wilde here, who played in the original production, and they're joined by Louis Armstrong Mayock also. So, um, damn it, we're going to give it a go. And then we have the, the, uh, the absolute finale, which will uh, involve the children of Edwina Guppian's Ark Dousa. Uh, dancers and that's going to be something special I'll explain to you the context in a minute and Vincent de McGraw will join us for um, the, the music for the, 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 the finale but You have to invest in an umbrella. You've all been fantastic staying episode. in this miserable weather. <laughs> you deserve such a huge round of applause. I'm definitely going to have to get something better than this. And I think it's very fitting as well to hear from Vincent McGrath, who's a member of a community under the challenge, making the links with. Uh, Leitrim, and it's worth saying as well that the uh, ban on fracking, which largely came from the people of Leitrim, that a huge contributory factor to that was the advice we got from the people in Rossport who opposed Shell Corrib. So it was absolutely invaluable, and one guy in particular, John Monaghan, told us he was the first person to ask the word to tell us the word fracking. He said, if that's what they're bringing in here, you need to watch uh, a film called Gaslands. And within two weeks, Johnny Gogan, who's here, had the mobile cinema going around Leitrim showing the film Gaslands. That was thanks to John Monaghan and the people of Rossport for tipping us off. So thanks to Vincent McGrath. So this is just a little uh, piece from uh, Towards the end of uh, Jimmy's story in Ireland, um, after the hall had been burned down, there was a deportation order issued against him in uh, January 1932. He had to uh, go on the run. He was living as a refugee in his own country. Um, and he was finally caught. He was captured and he was uh, taken from Carrick on Shannon down to Cove and put on a, a ship called the Britannia Star, if I'm right, that brought him to New York. And believe it or not, they took the money out of his pocket to pay the Britannia Star liner for his passage. He had 20 pounds in his pocket that he got from selling two cows and that he had to pay his own deportation passage. I declare Ireland a land where everyone is guaranteed a solid space on which to place their feet, to assemble, to learn, to dance if they wish, in whatever way they want, for as long as they want. You may deport what you label the alien, 
But the Groucho idea lives on and on and on. It lives among those in fear of deportation today. It lives among the traveling community. It lives among the neglected, the left behind, the ignored. It lives among those who sweeney away from the insanity around them. It lives among those denied the chance to dance with their limbs but who tango in their heads. It lives among those denied and those who reside in hospital beds. It lives among those on zero hours contracts but upward only rents. It lives among those forced to beg each day for a night's shelter from the elements. It lives in the network of solidarity among communities of challenge. Challenge the business as usual. Challenge the quick book on the make. Challenge the free market fundamentalism. Challenge the same as it ever was said in new words. Challenge to bankers long gone mad on their greed. Challenge to know the side that the bread is buttered on. Challenge to well, they will all have to suffer. Uttered by those who make sure they don't suffer at all, at all, at all, at all. Challenge to what's the point in making a fuss? Challenge to glib docility dressed as common sense. Challenge lives among those creating visions of renewal, visions of idealism, visions of equality, visions of fairness, visions of care, visions of public rights and public responsibilities, visions of communal solidarity, Visions of real equal opportunities for all, wherever they may come from. Worked, crafted, achievable visions of eventual, total, individual, communal free dance. Never again will we evict into the street anyone sunken in debt, none of their making. Never again will we confine asylum seekers in open prison and call it direct provision. Never again will we deport children and parents in the middle of the night or any other time. Never again will we do to others what was done to Jimmy Gralton in 1933. Never again we rise above it. We dance. and our support to all those suffering oppression. Come into Jimmy Grouton's dance hall and feel free to dance. We Jimmy Grouton our support to all those supporting those resisting oppression. Come into Jimmy Grouton's dance hall and feel free to dance. We Jimmy Grouton our support to all those, all those everywhere who team their communality. Come into Jimmy Grouton's dance hall and feel free to, feel free to, feel free to dance in whatever way you want. Feel free.
we get to the moment where we brush the fear out of Ephrata, out of Leitrim, out of Ireland, out of the world. We're going to have the art those dancers joining us now. Can I ask Vincent McGrath and Gregory Daly to come to the stage as well? Just to play the... And we'll um, supply the, the music for the dance. Here we are now, ready to brush all the fear out of Ireland. And huge thanks to Adriana Gutnian for having the, the, the ambition and the uh, wherewithal to make this bonfire dance a thing. And would you look at it, the bloody weather is clearing up now.
So, already okay, little joke. Here we go, little joke. Oh, no, I'm glad. Give me at least half a dozen. We're now going to, uh, we're working towards lighting the, the flame of the bonfire. So, uh, uh, so, oh, actually, yes, there is a little story I want to tell. <laughs> they, one of the people that Jimmy Grogan would have been inspired by in America in the, uh, in the early 1900s would have been Frederick Douglass, who was the uh, famous anti-slavery campaigner. And Frederick Douglass actually came to Ireland in 1845, and in one speech he said, I want to encircle America with a girdle of anti-slavery fire that reflects light on the slave institutions and alarms their guilty upholders. So that's mm -hmm. good flame. And that's what we're going to have in Ephraim tonight. And that's what Jimmy Gordon will be thinking when he lights the bonfire. I don't think it was. It was now. Yes. Maybe it's better than this. Jesus. <laughs> 